Welcome to Bible Insights with Wayne Conrad. God's Word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. How do you begin to tell the story, the narrative of Jesus of Nazareth, son of Mary, the Messiah? We have four written narratives of the actions and teachings of Jesus, culminating in his suffering, death, burial, and resurrection ascension. And each one is written by a disciple of Jesus. Two are apostles who accompanied Jesus for three years, namely Matthew and John. Today, I want us to focus on the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John begins with a prologue. And John is the most unique of the Gospel narratives. And he begins his presentation of Jesus of Nazareth with a prologue that's located in eternity. In words that echo Genesis 1, 1 through 3, he writes, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This one was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him was not one thing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of humanity, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Now here's Genesis chapter 1. It reads, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Do you see the parallels? John continues in verse 6. A man came sent from God whose name was John. This one came for a witness in order that he could testify about the light so that all would believe through him. That one was not the light, but he came in order that he could testify about the light. The true light who gives light to every person was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world came into being through him and the world did not recognize him. He came to his own things or his own possessions and his own people did not receive him. But as many as received him, To those who believed in his name, he gave to them authority to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of a husband, but of God. Now notice, John, the forerunner, purpose was to bear witness to Jesus, who is the light that's come into the world. Now the apostle John, who is writing this letter, is also one who is going to bear witness to Jesus, who is the light of the world. John presents to us an unvarnished picture of Jesus, his undiminished deity, incarnate through the Virgin Mary that he doesn't mention, but who is nevertheless the incarnate God. And he wants to show us that in his gospel narrative. He continues in John 1.14. And the word, that's the one he talked about was in the beginning who was with God and was God. And the word became flesh and took up residence among us. And we saw his glory, glory as of the one and only from the father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out saying, this was he about whom I said, the one who comes after me is ahead of me because he existed before me. For from his fullness we've all received, and grace after grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came about through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God in any time. The one and only God, the one who is in the bosom of the Father, that one has made him known. Now these are tremendous words that John has written. And notice that the forerunner, John the Baptist, declares, it's not about me, it's about him, the one who existed before me, the one who has existed from the beginning, the apostle tells us. But it's true that John, the baptizer, was actually six months older than Jesus in the days of his flesh. But he's testifying that Christ existed before him. So it is an indirect testimony to the deity of Jesus Christ. Now, Like the first verses of John echoing Genesis 1, there are interesting parallels in John chapter 1, 14 
through 18, which I just read, with Exodus 33 and 34. Please note, in Exodus, Israel finds grace in Yahweh's sight, while the disciples in John 1 receive grace upon grace. God tells Moses in Exodus 33, 20, you cannot see my face for a man shall not see me and live. And John repeats this truth. No one has ever seen God. John 1, 18, 8. Yahweh shelters Moses in a cleft of a rock and covers him with his hand while his glory passes by in Exodus 34, verse 22. The disciples behold the glory of the incarnate word. John writes, we have seen his glory as of the only Son from the Father. Yahweh declares his name to Moses as he passes by. And Yahweh passed over before him, and he proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh, God, who is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding with loyal love and faithfulness or truth. And Jesus, in John 1, 14 and 17, is said to be full of grace and truth. Now, Yahweh, in the days of Moses with Israel in the wilderness, dwells in the tent of meeting. We read, when Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and remain at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord to speak with Moses there, Exodus 33, 9. John writes, the word became flesh and took up his residence among us. We observed his glory, the glories of the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth, John 1, 14. The literal translation is, he pitched his tent, or tabernacled, among us. In Exodus 34, 27 and 28, Moses was given the law, and John asserts the same in John 1, 17. The, the law came by Moses. But lastly, Moses was the mediator between Yahweh and Israel, the people of the Hebrews. But Jesus is the mediator between God and humanity. John 1, 18, the one and only Son who, in, who is in the bosom of the Father has declared him or made him known. Now, John's narrative is the last one of the gospel narratives written. And his purpose in writing is plainly stated in John chapter 20 and verse 30. He writes, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. He goes on to write in John 21, 24, 25. This is the disciple who is testifying about these things and who has written down these things. And we know that his testimony is true. Now, there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written down one after the other, I suppose not even the world itself could contain the books that could be written. Now, some Bible scholars see two major divisions in John's narrative, which are labeled the book of signs from John 1.19 and ending at John 12.50. And the second division is called the book of the passion, which begins in chapter 13. Today's broadcast were primarily focused on the book of the signs. But the second section begins with an extended teaching discourse by Jesus in the upper room, preparing his disciples for his imminent suffering and death, followed by his resurrection and ascension and the coming of the Spirit. John then gives his eyewitness account of Jesus' trials, crucifixion, burial, resurrection, and post-resurrection ministry. But today, Let's look at the book of the signs. We learn that John writes of certain selected signs which Jesus did to which he and other apostles were eyewitnesses. Evidently, these seven signs were some that greatly impressed John with the glory of Christ. These works of divine power validated Jesus' messiahship. The first of these recorded miracle signs was the turning of pots of water into the best wine at a wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him, writes John. So John's purpose in showing us these seven signs is to convince his readers that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the promised one. 
so that believing in him, people will receive eternal life. He develops his witness around seven signs. Let me tell you the signs and one that sometimes is counted as a sign and sometimes is not. Sign number one, the turning of water into wine at the wedding feast of Cana, recorded in John 2, verses 1 through 11. Now, the second sign is not a miracle, but is the cleansing of the temple in John 2, 13 through 25. And in verses 18 through 19, we see the prediction of his resurrection, which was fulfilled in Jesus' resurrection recorded in John chapters 20 and 21. So here's the passage, John 2, verse 18. So the Jews answered and said to him after he had cleansed the temple, what sign do you show to us because you're doing these things? So they want to know what the sign is. And Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, This temple has been under construction 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the saying that Jesus had spoken. So I number this, the second sign, although it's really not the second sign as far as a miracle is concerned, but it is the eighth sign. It's the one that following the seven, which validates all of Jesus' claims, his resurrection from the dead. So the second sign that John records that's a miracle is the healing of the official son in John 4, 46 through 54, followed by the third sign, the healing of the paralytic at the pool of Bethesda at the temple in Jerusalem, John 5, 1 through 18. Then follows the feeding of the 5,000 with five barley loaves and two fish recorded in John uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. And this is linked with the feeding of Israel in the wilderness in John chapter 6, verses 31 to 33. Exodus sixteen fifteen, the Amplified Bible reads, When the Israelites saw it, that is the manna, they said to one another, Manna, what is it? For they did not woe, did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. And he gave it to them for the forty years of wilderness, the forty years it took for them to go from Egypt to the promised land although it only took two years for them to reach there, but because of their unbelief, they could not enter in and were walking around in the wilderness another 38 years before the second generation was allowed to enter the land. But Jesus is indeed the true bread of life, and he gives us eternal life, not just physical life. The next sign, number five or six, how you're numbering it, Jesus is walking on the water to his disciples during the night when the boat is on a storm-tossed sea. Now, this is a miracle sign because it refers to what God, Yahweh, Jehovah God does. This recorded in Psalm 107, verses 26 through 30. And the psalmist is giving testimony of those who are riding out a storm in a boat on the sea. I read, rising up to the sky, sinking down to the depths, their courage melting away in anguish. They reeled and staggered like drunken men, and all their skill was useless. Then they cried out to the Lord. They cried out to Yahweh in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a murmur, and the waves of the sea were hushed. They rejoiced when the waves grew quiet. Then he guided them to the harbor they longed for. We read in John chapter 6 that when Jesus got into the boat and he said, Peace, be still, the waters hushed and the boat was suddenly on the shore. The next sign is the healing of a man who was born blind in John chapter 9, verses 1 through 41. We read in verse 2, And his disciples asked Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. 
because most people thought that if one was born blind, he was either because her parents had done some great sin or he had done some great sin. And Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. So when Jesus then proceeds to heal the man who was born blind, he is doing the works of God. His glory is thus manifested to his disciples. The seventh sign, or the eighth, whichever one you want to count it, is the raising of Lazarus from the dead after he had been in the grave four days. This is recorded for us in John chapter 11, verses 1 through 46. Now this event foreshadows Jesus' own resurrection from the dead as well as that of his believers. Now, there's a difference between the resurrection of any dead that Jesus or others might have done and the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Here's the difference. When Lazarus is raised from the dead by Jesus, he is raised still in a mortal body subject to death. So Lazarus will die again in the flesh and will perish in that respect. But when Jesus was raised from the dead, it's in a glorified body that is never again subject to death. It is an immortal physical body. So we read in John 11, the following words. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany. So the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Now, it does lead to temporary death, evidently. But it's not permanent because he's raising from the dead. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, this is the reason, you see, Jesus did not go immediately to raise Lazarus from the bed of sickness because he must die and then be raised so that the glory of God will be manifested through this sign. So when Jesus arrives and there is this interaction between he, Mary, and Martha. He goes to the grave, and he says to Martha, remove the stone, or remove the stone to the men around. And Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, he's already decaying. It's been four days. Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you hear, heard me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd standing here, I said this so they may believe you sent me. And he said this. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, bound hand and foot with linen strips and with his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he did believed in him. Those are the seven signs, but the eighth and all conclusive sign is Jesus' own bodily resurrection from the dead on the third day after his crucifixion that had been foretold by his cleansing of the temple and the conversation he had with the Jews at that point. Now, with each of these signs, Jesus gives an explanation which connects him to the revelation of God in Israel's history or the event's timing points to its meaning itself. In connection with the signs, John records revelatory conversations. This is another unique distinctive of the gospel of John. We'll not be looking at those today. Another mark of John's gospel is the association of Jesus with the revelation of God in his attributes revealed in his name. These seven I am statements connect Jesus to the very name of God recorded for us in Exodus chapter 3 and Exodus chapters 33 and 34. The name of God, Yahweh, or I am, or I am that I am. Let me read for you. From John, he writes, 
I do not seek my glory. The one who seeks it is also judges. I assure you that if anyone keeps my word, he will never, ever see death. Then the Jews said to him, Now we know you have a demon. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. You say if anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death, ever. And are you then greater than our father Abraham who died? Even the prophets died. What do you pretend to be? If I glorify myself, Jesus answered, my glory is nothing. My father, you say about him, he is our God. He is the one who glorifies me. You've never known me, but I know him. You've never known him, but I know him. If I were to say I don't know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham was overjoyed that he would see my day. He saw it and rejoiced. And the Jews replied, You aren't 50 years old yet, and you've seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, I assure you, before Abraham was, I am. At that, they picked up stones to throw at him. Now, you need to connect these verses back with the prologue in John chapter 1, where it says that Jesus was the Word who was in the very bosom of the Father, who has come into the world to make him known. Jesus makes the following declarations with I am statements. He says, I am the bread of life in John chapter 6, verse 35 and 48 and 51. And this was on the occasion when the people were being journeying to Jerusalem for the Passover. At the Feast of Booths and Tabernacles recorded in John 7 and 8, the following statement is made by the people, John 7, 31. Yet many of the people believed in him, they said, when the Christ appears, that is, when the Messiah appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? So this is John's theme, the signs. Jesus declares in John 8, 12, and 9, 5, I am the light of the world. Do you see that's connection back with John chapter 1, with the creation account? In John chapter 10 and verse 7, Jesus says, I am the gate. In John chapter 10, verse 11 and 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. In John eleven twenty-five, 25, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. That was in the event of him raising Lazarus from the dead. In John 14, 16, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In John 15, 1, I am the true vine. So as we think about the way John's gospel begins, we just said there are obvious links to the beginning of the Bible in Genesis and Exodus with creation itself and God bringing light into the world as Christ was the light of the world and with Yahweh's revelation of himself to Moses and to Israel. So Jesus reveals God's nature to humanity. The book of John, or the gospel of John, is also known as I've said, is the book of signs. For it presents seven signs that reveal Jesus as the Son of God, such as his raising Lazarus from the dead, and it culminates in the eighth sign of his own resurrection from the dead. We have also seen that Jesus' nature, his attributes, are exactly the same as those of Yahweh in the Old Testament. And therefore, for example, we see that God is the great shepherd of his people, and so in John's gospel, we see that Jesus declares that he's the good shepherd who came to lay down his life for a sheep. The apostle John, from his intimate knowledge of Christ and being led by the Spirit, presents to us in this gospel the word who became flesh, Jesus himself, the divine son, who lived, died, and rose for the salvation of his people. John's gospel brings us face to face with the Messiah, the Christ of God, Jesus, the Lord, the only Savior for sinners. To read of him brings, to read him, to read John's gospel, will bring us to the knowledge of Jesus and to faith in him. 
This is true in eternal life. Here's my challenge. Read John's narrative. Learn what he's saying and receive the blessing that Christ came to give through his death and resurrection from the dead, the gift of eternal life to all who believe in him. This has been Wayne Conrad with Bible Insights. And the next time, remember, Jesus is the gospel.